Our scripture reading today comes from 1 John chapter 4, verse 15 down through verse 21. Whoever confesses that Jesus is the Son of God, God abides in him, and he in God. We have come to know and have believed the love which God has for us. God is love. And the one who abides in love abides in God, and God abides in him. By this, love is perfected with us, so that we may have confidence in the day of judgment, because as he is, so also are we in this world. There is no fear in love, but perfect love casts out fear, because fear involves punishment, and the one who fears is not perfected in love. We love because he first loved us. If someone says, I love God and hates his brother, he is a liar. For the one who does not love his brother whom he has seen cannot love God whom he has not seen. And this commandment we have from him, that the one who loves God should love his brother also. This last week, I did a wedding in North Carolina for some members of our church. A couple kids and I piled in the van and made the three-and-a-half-hour drive down towards Fayetteville. And along the way, we found ourselves on a stretch of road that was obviously under construction. We came to a spot, and the first indication, which you've seen before, are those giant uh, neon orange road signs and the big black letters on it that read men at work so all the traffic came to a a snail's pace just slowed down and so we were driving along slowly and I was able to look around and see that they were widening the roads and sort of repairing things and for the next 15 or 20 minutes while we were driving through I, I noticed there was a lot of things I saw traffic cones, I saw concrete barriers, I saw piles of dirt, I saw earth-moving equipment, but you know the one thing I didn't see? I didn't see any men at work. (laughs) Now maybe it was on their lunch break, maybe it was a shift change, I don't know, but I thought it was ironic, that was the one thing the sign warned me about, and that was the one thing I did not see. You know, that little incident reminded me of our passage this morning because in this text, God is teaching us that every Christian is under construction. There is a spiritual work that is happening in every single believer, and God is doing it at this very moment. God is improving you. God is building you. God is changing and shaping you, making your heart and mind and life everything that he wants it to be. And and John's going to talk about that, but it's as if he's going to remind us of that by showing a, a, a giant neon sign. And John's sign doesn't say men at work, but rather John's sign says love at work. That's what's changing us. That's what's transforming us, is the love of God. Look down in your Bible at verse 17. This is kind of the heart of this section. He begins by saying, by this love is perfected with us. That's his point. John's been talking about God's love. We saw a lot of it last week. And today he's continuing that thought. And here he's picking up on the idea that that God's love has a transforming power. That God's love is not lazy. God's love is very busy. God's love is not passive, but God's love is always active. That that God's love is doing something at all times in us and through us and among us. From the day we trust Christ unto the day that we see Christ. God's love is at work. But let's be honest, there are times like that construction site I saw when maybe it doesn't seem 
like anything's happening. We, we look and we don't see God's love. It's not something we can see with our eyes. And maybe we say, well, I don't really, I don't really feel God's love. You, you might say, you know, this week I didn't do too much for Jesus. I didn't pray well like I should. I didn't read my Bible like I should. I, I didn't really do a whole lot for Jesus. John reminds us that may be true, but Jesus is doing much for you. He's actually working in your heart when you don't even see it. We don't even realize it. His love is shaping us. And you may not be able to see God's love, and you not, may not be able in some ways to touch God's love, and you may not be able to feel God's love, but John says, rest assured, you can trust God's love. Because God's love is at work. So maybe you don't feel it. That's okay. I urge you to trust it. To trust God's love. So how do we know his love is at work? Well, then John tells us in this passage what, why that is. There's three ways in this text that we see that love is at work in and among his people. And look at your own life. Look at what God's done and see if this isn't true. First of all, John tells us in verses 15 and 16 here that love proves faith is real. Love proves that faith is real. Notice verse 15 and 16. Whoever confesses that Jesus is the Son of God, God abides in him and he in God. We have come to know and have believed the love which God has for us. God is love and the one who abides in love abides in God and God abides in him. Notice John is showing us the connection between loving and believing. Once again, John draws our attention, though, in verse 15 to what we call the doctrinal test. Notice he says, whoever confesses that Jesus is the Son of God. First John is all about Christian certainty. So how do you have this certainty? Well, John has given us three tests that we can apply. You've heard these in the series. If you're new, John has told us there's the moral test. Do we love the commands of God? There's the social test. Do we love the people of God? And there's also the doctrinal test, do we love the Son of God? And a person who can say yes to all three, John says, then you know that you have eternal life. If you can't say yes to those questions, John says, then you shouldn't take sure. You shouldn't have confidence that you have eternal life. And so once again, John is spiraling through these questions, and he comes back again in verse 15 to that all-important question, the doctrinal one. He, talking about, he talks about whoever confesses Jesus. Notice at the end of last week in verse 15, 14, excuse me, he said that Jesus, that the Son, is what? The Savior of the world. But my friends, listen to me. It is not enough to believe that Jesus is a Savior, or even that Jesus is the Savior. You must believe that Jesus is my Savior. That's verse 15. Whoever confesses that Jesus is the Son of God. That is both open-ended, whoever, but also personal. It's an invitation to Christ that is extended to everyone, everywhere. That whoever includes all people, Jewish people and Gentile people, male people and female people, free people and slave people, Rich people and poor people, white people and black people. Why? Because Revelation 22 says, Whosoever will may come and be saved. And so John says, whoever confesses, they have this life. We had family dedication a moment ago. Tim was very clear and helpful in explaining what was happening. And, and yet, may I remind you that these parents, they can teach their children about Christ. They can guide their children towards Christ, but they cannot believe for their children. Their children must also confess for themselves. That is our prayer. That is why we commit ourselves towards this, that they might come to know Him. And why does a boy or a girl, why does a man or a woman, why does a person actually confess Christ? Do we do that because we're smarter than all the unbelievers? Do we do that because, well, we're a little bit more deserving? No, John says the reason we do that is look at the rest of verse 15. Whoever confesses that Jesus is Son of God 
It's because God abides in him and he in God. He says God abides. God is doing a work in that person. You cannot believe the apostles' words without the Spirit's work. And John is saying the Spirit is at work in those who actually confess faith in Jesus. If you're a Christian, you didn't come to that conclusion on your own. In fact, do you remember what what Peter, when he confessed Jesus, what did Jesus say to him? Jesus said to him, flesh and blood did not reveal this to you, but my Father who is in heaven. So it was God at work in Peter's life. And likewise, everyone who truly confesses Jesus and is saved, they're not doing that because it was up to them. They're doing that because God abides and works in them. This is one of the astounding truths of Christianity, that when a person is saved, it means that God himself takes up residence in you. Notice what he says there. God abides in him and he in God. There's a mutual indwelling. It's you in Christ and Christ in you. And the very Holy Spirit, the Spirit of Christ, he he becomes a, a legal permanent resident. He moves in. Like buying a home and you become an occupant. The Holy Spirit comes and lives inside of all of God's children. Now, maybe you're here and you're thinking, well, I'm, I'm not a Christian. And I'll be honest, sometimes I feel, I do feel kind of lonely. Maybe not, you know, I've got friends and family, but deep down I feel kind of like cosmically lonely. Like something's not right. Like something's missing. Like life is not satisfying as it should be. My friends, Ecclesiastes says that God has placed eternity in our hearts. And the only thing that can fill a God-shaped hole is, guess what? God. And there's a place for God to abide, if you will. And my friends, you can have God's presence once you confess God's Son. That's what he says. Whoever confesses, God abides in him and he in God. That is the good news of the gospel. That's why we've gathered here today. Because we want to be reminded by the fact that of what Christ has done for us. That Jesus lived a sinless life and died a death in our place. And then he rose from the dead to grant forgiveness of sins and salvation. To give hope and faith and life and a new purpose to all that re- would repent and believe in him. And my friends, the good news of the gospel is that not only does God save you when you confess Christ, God indwells you. He abides in you. And you now have the very Spirit of God at work in you. And so John assures us of this in verse 16. He says, and we have come to know and have believed the love which God has for us. Notice he doesn't say in verse 16 that we feel the love which God has for us. Sometimes we feel God's love. Sometimes we don't. When I wake up in the middle of the night to go get a drink of water or use the bathroom and I stub my toe and I step on the cat's tail and I trip and fall, I do not feel like God loves me in that moment. Right? There's moments when we don't feel like God loves us, but, but John says it's not about always feeling God's love. It's about what? Believing God's love. Trusting God's love. And by talking about trusting God's love, he's comparing that and, and, and um, he's defining that as confessing God's Son. So it's not that love produces faith, but rather it's faith that produces this love in our hearts towards God. Because he's saying here that Jesus is the, is the embodiment of God's love. He's the expression of God's love. We have come to know and have believed the love which God has for us. That love is found in Christ. Unbelievers may have warm fuzzies about God and they may know some many right things about God, but my friend, you will never fully know God's love until you know God's Son. Jesus is God's love in the world. He is God's love, and God's love is for us. That's why Jesus lived for us and died for us and rose for us, that we might believe and trust in him. 
so that why? Look at the end of verse 16. He says again, God is love, and the one who abides in love abides in God, and God abides in him. Notice John uses that word abides, both in verse 15 and 16. He uses it four or five times, at least implied, five times in those verses. To abide in something means to live there. It means to dwell there. It means to, to take up residence there. It made me think about, I was talking to a man this week at the wedding, and we were just chit-chatting about this weekend and Mother's Day, and he was probably in his 70s, I think he told me, and he was saying about going to visit his mom, and I was surprised at his age, and he said, oh yeah, my mom's up in her 90s now, and uh, I said, well, good for you, you know, that's, that's great, and so forth, and he said, and not only that, he goes, you know why I love going to see my mom? I said, why? He said, because she still lives in the house that I grew up in. I said, really? He said, yeah. He said, I drive home, and he said, so I'm pulling that driveway. He said, what? I see the trees I used to climb. I think of all the meals we ate. He said, I, I, I think of all the t fun times we had playing in the yard. And he says, I, I've, that, I've traveled all over the world. He goes, but that's the place I want to be. That's the place that makes me feel safe. That's the place where I know I'm accepted. That's the place I love going home. My friends, John is saying here, that the love of God is where his people feel at home. The place where we are safe, the place where we are accepted, the place where we would rather be more than anywhere else is to abide in his love. Maybe you've ignored God's love this week. That's okay, because guess what? God's love has not ignored you this week. God's love is coming after you and working in you. How do we know that we're saved? John says we keep coming back again and again and again and again to believing in Christ, to confessing Christ, and to place our hope and our trust in God's love. And in that, we see that love proves that faith is real. That there's no other place you'd rather be than in the love of God. Safe in the presence of God. John says that's, that shows that love is at work in you. That then leads John to a second point here in verses 17 and 18. Number two, he tells us that love also removes the fear of judgment. So love proves that faith is real, but it also removes the fear of judgment. Notice verse 17. He says, by this love is perfected with us so that we may have confidence in the day of judgment. So John says, the love of God is doing something. It's completing itself, it's working in you. And one of the ways you know that God's love is actually working in you is that he says, you have confidence in the day or for the day of judgment. Because as he is, so also are we in this world. Then actually notice 18, there is no fear in love, but perfect love casts out fear because fear involves punishment. You know, every human being at some point asks themselves the question, I wonder what happens when I die. And none of us have the answer through experience. And there are people who spend tons of monies, money going to, to, to gurus and swamis and mystics to tell them what happens in the afterlife. If you just happen to be one of those people here today, I can save you a bunch of money. We'll still take your money, but I can save you money. You don't have to pay. You don't have to pay for it. The Bible tells us exactly what happens after we die. It says in the book of Hebrews, quote, is appointed unto man once to die, and after this comes the judgment. No reincarnation. No second chances. At some point, you will die, and at a later point, you will be judged. Your soul doesn't dissolve and disappear into the ethereal. You will stand before a holy and righteous God. And John says that idea for many people, it evokes, verse 18, fear. It bothers them, as it should. The, the prospect of future judgment is a very scary thing. I know it's graduation weekend when my wife graduated from college oh, a long time ago. When uh, I went down there to see her, to, to visit her for the weekend. Oh, was that funny? I was meant to be funny. Uh, we, 
I went down there to see her, and the night before, we were out late, you know, just enjoying getting ready for everything, and uh, being young and foolish and not paying attention, I got, I got pulled over for speeding. And so, and the cop, for some reason, and yes, the pastor's not perfect, I know, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. <laughs> and, and, and for whatever reason, the cop, he was convinced that I had been drinking, which I had not been drinking, but he wrote me this big ticket, and so I had to go to court. I knew what I had done wrong, and I knew what I hadn't done wrong, but so I had to go to court. And I had, it's the first time I'd ever been to court. I was a wreck. I couldn't sleep the week before. I couldn't hardly eat. My stomach was in knots, you know, and I was so anxious at this future time of standing before a judge. And that was only like a $200 speeding ticket. Imagine standing before a judge who knows everything about you. And he knows it perfectly. Every sin you've committed. Every, sin, every sinful thought. Every sinful motive. Every sinful deed. He even knows the sins you committed that you didn't know you committed. He knows everything perfectly. And when you think about standing before him, what feeling do you have? John says some people will have fear but others he says in verse 17 will actually have confidence now i don't know what judgment day will look like but it's really interesting here i was i was thinking about this i'm going to use my sanctified imagination for a second but it's as if john is saying on judgment day imagine i don't know maybe we're all standing in line he says there's going to be some people there on judgment day, he said, who will be on their hands and knees sweating, wringing their hands at the prospect of standing before God. And, and, and they're just a mess on the ground, wait, because they're so trembling with fear, and others will be standing there going, <whistles> with confidence. As if, <laughs> just like that, yes, I know. But imagine, like, looking over and saying, hey, are you okay? Right? You didn't know this was, oh, you did know this was coming. Right? The fact is, judgment's coming for all of us. And John says, some will be gripped with fear, and others will stand tall. They will stand with confidence before the day of judgment. What, what an incredible thought. How is it that some people can approach that thought without, without that fear, without that dread? Well, John tells us, love is perfected with us so that we may have confidence in the day. Why? Because as he is, so also are we in this world. What does that mean? I think the he in verse 17 is a reference to Jesus. In other words, as Jesus is, so also are we. As the Son of God is, so also the sons and daughters of God are. What does that mean? That just as Jesus is accepted by God, just as Jesus can, if you will, stand tall before God, just as Jesus has a good standing with the judge, he says, as he is, so also are we. And why do we have that confidence? Because the Bible tells us that his righteousness is our righteousness. That his verdict is our verdict. That his future is our future. And if the Father says of Jesus, this is my beloved Son in whom I am well pleased, then if you are in Christ, then he says the same thing about you. So you don't have to fear judgment day. If you know the love of Christ, then you should have the confidence of Christ. And the basis of that confidence is not you and your works, but it is confessing Jesus and his works. If God receives him, then he will receive you because love casts out fear. It gets rid of it. But if you're not in Jesus, it's a different story. If you don't know Christ, if you've not confessed him, then you should, as verse 18 says, be filled with fear involving punishment. That word is used by Jesus in Matthew 28 when he talks about the end times final judgment and he refers to those that are cast into the eternal punishment of fire that is reserved for the devil and his angels. That is what Jesus said. 
that the eternal punishment is indeed that, an eternal separation from God. But my friends, listen to me. If you are in Christ, you don't have to fear being cast out of God's presence. You know why? Because right now you already have God's presence. And he's not going to back down from that. If he's already given you his spirit, as you've confessed his son, then he will welcome you into his presence forever. You don't have to fear God's hate because you already have God's love. And so we have confidence, he said, because of Christ, because of what he has done. But for those that don't have Christ, then they have fear. And they should. I don't know about you, I, I like movies like many people. And I'll watch just about any kind of movie that's out there, certainly. But the, the one kind of movie I refuse to watch that I hate to watch are horror movies. I don't mind the blood and gore. That I mean, sometimes it does. But usually that's not the thing that gets me. I don't like being scared. You know, I just hate being afraid. I hate the anxiety and the uncertainty. You know, when you're watching a movie and it gets all quiet. And the camera zooms in real slowly. And the doorknob starts to jiggle real slow, you know. And the music, music gets all spooky, right? And the shadow kind of crosses. Ugh, I hate that. It's so, it may, what does it do? It makes me feel like unsafe. I might be sitting in my own house, but it, it makes me feel so nervous and anxious and uncertain. My friends, does the coming judgment that is slowly coming for you for the day that you die, D does, the, does that approaching, does that make you feel scared? Or does that make you feel safe? Because if you're in Christ, it's safety. It's a transport into the presence of God. The down payment that he's given you now of his spirit and his love will bring you once and for all into his presence eternally. But if you don't have that, then yes, you should feel scared, you should feel nervous, you should feel terrified. But that's the whole point of the gospel that John's been talking about. This is why Christ came, to deliver us from the fear of death. That we wouldn't be slaves to that prospect, but rather we would have confidence. My friend, listen, you don't have to be scared of judgment day. You don't have to be fearful. You don't have to feel unsafe about judgment day. All you need to do now is to receive God's love in Christ. Because his love, when it's perfected, it puts confidence in the heart of the believer. Granted, Christians have a respect for judgment day because we too will give an account. But we do not dread judgment day and we do not if fear eternal judgment. Do you know why? Because in Christ, our eternal judgment has been moved from the future to the past. Our eternal judgment was poured out on Good Friday. Our eternal judgment for the, the wrath of God against sin took place in His body on the tree. And so we don't have to fear that prospect. We don't have to because our hope is in Christ and Christ has already taken it and he said on the cross, it is finished. The price was paid. The penalty is done. And for those that are in Christ, we don't have that fear. Because why? Because fear, because love removes fear from God's people. Do you have that fear today? Does the prospect of judgment day terrify you? My friends, the only hope is to have that fear ripped out of you and it can be ripped out of you through faith in Jesus. Receive his love. Receive his life. Trust in him now. He's promised all that come to me. I will by no means cast them out. So love it removes fear. Third and finally, John tells us that love, we know it's at work because love also exposes frauds among us. Love exposes frauds. Look at verse 19. He says, we love because he first loved us. John reminds us again that God's love is the starting point for our love. Right? We've already talked about this. There would be no horizontal 
if there wasn't the vertical. There'd be no Christian affection and, and certainly no human affection if there wasn't first divine affection. Love starts with God. Why? Because God is love. In fact, think about that. Some people object to, to uh, the existence of God because they see all the bad stuff in this world. People look around and they see, you know, war and violence and racism and rape and Down syndrome and cancer and tornadoes. They see all the bad stuff and they say, aha, see? How can there be a good God and there's all this bad stuff? Well, that's a, that's a good, hard question. And one that we as Christians must be ready and able to answer. But my friend, that's not a, a, the slam dunk question that it appears to be. Because if they say, well, there, if there is a God, explain the problem of evil, part of our response is, well, if there is no God, then explain the gift of love. And while you're at it, explain beauty and truth and virtue. Where does all that come from? Every human being has these deep longings of the heart. These affections that transcend time and space. Some of us love people that have been dead for decades. We love people we've never met. We love people who aren't even born. How is it that we can have a love that, that transcends the very people sitting in front of us because there's something about it that comes from the very image of God because all human love is grounded in divine love. And so we love because he first loved us. But what does it mean to love? John gives us a case study, verse 20. If someone says, well, I love God and hates his brother, he's a liar. Now notice John in verse 20 is focusing on people who claim to love God. This isn't about pagans or unbelievers. This is about people that have, you know, fish stickers on the back of their cars. These are professed Christians. And John says, look, talk is cheap. Anybody can wear a shirt that says, I love God. Anybody can plaster a bumper sticker that says, I love God. That's an easy claim to make. John says that every such claim should be evaluated and should be tested. And we test the vertical claim by the horizontal evidence. So John says, if someone says, oh, I love God, but he hates his brother or its brother or sister, somebody in the community of faith, John says that that man is a liar. It's exactly what James said, if you remember James, about faith. Remember James? James says if someone says, oh, I have faith, but he doesn't have works, all he has is faith. So-called faith, empty faith. Why? Because there has to be works for it to be true faith. That's exactly what John is saying. Somebody says, oh, I, I love God, but he doesn't love the brothers and sisters of the church. He says all he has is love, so-called love. If faith without works is dead, so too love without works is dead. It's an empty claim. So if the Twitter profile says, I love Jesus, but all of the tweets say, I despise certain Christians, don't believe the profile. John says he's a liar. In fact, my kids taught me a word this week. I'm trying to be hip and cool with young people. If you've got kids that watch YouTube, you probably, they taught me a new word this week. S-U-S. Sus. You ever heard that before? It's a shortening of being suspicious, but they'll call each other, oh, you're sus, right? You're, he's being sus, right? It means somebody who's lying or being an imposter. That's what John says. The man who says, I love God, but he doesn't love the brotherhood, he's spiritually sus. Don't believe him. He's a fraud. Listen, Bible degrees don't prove that you're a Christian. Online followers don't prove that you're a Christian. Knowledge does not prove that you're a Christian. It is love that proves you're a Christian. And John says, the man who can say all day I love God but doesn't demonstrate that, he's lying. How do you know? Because the end of verse 20 he says, for the one who does not love his brother whom he has seen cannot love God whom he has not seen. Now I love this. John says that part of loving, watch this, part of loving God right, is loving God's word and loving God's son and loving God's spirit and loving God's promises. But part of loving God is also loving God's image. And where do we see God's image? 
and the people around them. They are made in the very image of God. You cannot claim to love God and then hate His image. His fingerprints are all around you in this room and all around us in the world. To love the Creator is to love His creation. Or more specifically, to love the Redeemer is to love the redeemed. To love Christ or to love other Christians. And those who would deny that or reject that or not demonstrate that, John says, don't believe them. He wraps it up, verse 21, And this commandment we have from him, that the one who loves God should love his brother also. Notice he calls this a commandment. Jesus gave us this commandment. This is not something we can do or should do or, yeah, it's a nice thing to do. No, John says we must do this. And a person who refuses to do this is either living in disobedience as a Christian or is proving they're actually not a Christian in the first place. Jesus gave us this commandment on the night that he washed the disciples' feet. Which means what? That loving brothers and sisters shows up in real, tangible ways. How do we keep the commandment, verse 21? We love by making meals for each other. We love by visiting each other when we're sick. We love by calling each other when we're going through a bad time. We love by by sitting down and talking to each other and hearing each other's burdens and concerns. We love by crying on each other's shoulders when we need it. We love by being there in our times of need. We love by helping each other when we move. We love by helping each other watch our kids. We love by raking each other's leaves. We love by washing each other's feet. We love by participating in each other's life. You want to know how to spot a fraud in church? It's very simple. You will know a fraud because he or she is a spectator in the life of the church. Oh, I love God! But I'm not going to love them. John says, don't believe him. John is saying, if you pass the confessional test but you fail the love test, guess what? You failed the confessional test. You cannot say and claim to love God, and if it doesn't show up in day-to-day terms, it doesn't prove anything. Love is at work exposing the frauds among us. So brothers and sisters, you might not see God's love today, and you might not feel God's love, but rest assured, God's love is at work. It's at work changing you, shaping you like that construction zone. It is making you better whether you see it or not. So trust His love.